Hey everyone, welcome to Church Online again this week. Uh, I'm Jono, if you don't know me. Um, it's great uh, that we can, again, uh, meet together, Church Online, uh, and remind ourselves uh, and encourage one another how awesome God is. Uh, and so we're going to start um, by doing that with this song. Hey, and welcome again to Church Online. Uh, I'm Jono, if you missed that, uh, and it's great that you're here with us. Um, last week, um, we heard from um, Philippians 3, and we looked into that, and um, we saw how Paul, um, in, in chapter 3, verse 17, uh, he was encouraging the people of Philippi um, because Paul was so, um, so confident in, his, in, in the truth that he knew Uh, which was in Christ, that he asked them to, in verse 17, uh, join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, uh, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. Um, It's great that Paul is so confident that he asked people to um, imitate him and do what he does. Um, In this week, uh, we're going to go to um, 
the next chapter, Philippians chapter four, um, we're gonna hear from Adrian, um, and he's gonna talk about how um, from, in verse four, it says this, um, Paul, Paul tells us to um, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Um, it's amazing that we can um, rejoice in the Lord for what all he has done for us. Um, and so um, I wanna encourage you guys to, as you sit there at home, um, to be um, yeah, rejoicing in how amazing our Lord is, uh, what he has done for us, um, that we can still um, meet online uh, and encourage one another and remind each other how amazing he is. Um, if during the service, uh, you want to um, connect with us, uh, leave any feedback, uh, you want a prayer point, if you want to um, let us know anything that's going on in your life, you can use our connection card, you can use the link, you can click on that now. Um, you can uh, do that whenever you want. Um, please, uh, yeah, keep that in mind that uh, you can have that and to connect with us. Um, before we begin, please pray with me. Uh, Lord God, thank you so much uh, that we have um, Paul as an example uh, to to imitate uh, and to um, be like, uh, please help us to be, um, yeah, confident in um, your word and confident in the truth uh, that is your son, uh, that it is uh, your gift um, to the way of life and to heaven uh, and our future. Amen. Hey, 6 p.m., JJ here. We're gonna spend some time now doing something called Meet a Member. It's an opportunity to get to know somebody from our congregation, hear a bit of their story, and hear about how God has been work in, uh, working in their life. Uh, we're gonna meet somebody new to our congregation. Uh, I'm gonna ask a few questions to get to know them a little bit and hear their story. So first of all, do you wanna tell us uh, your name, uh, what you do uh, during the week, and how long you've been coming along to 6 p.m.? Yeah, so hi, my name is Matt. Um, I'm a student, so I study during the week. I'm hoping to be a teacher. Um, and I joined 6pm um, earlier this year, um, a few weeks before Pendex started. So. Okay, yeah, so it was all uh, very new for you coming to 6pm. We're going to hear a bit about uh, that experience a little later on. Uh, but before we kind of get to that, uh, just a few uh, fun questions for you. Uh, first of all, just tell us where you're living at the moment. Uh, what's your living arrangement and uh, how that working out? Yeah, okay. So I'm living in North Parramatta. I moved there with my housemate, Ben, who's also coming along to 6 p.m. Um, yeah, it's been great. Um, we haven't seen many other people at the moment because we're stuck in together, but we uh, haven't got too sick of one another yet. So yeah. it's still going well. Awesome. Awesome. One of the questions that we'd like to ask here at 6 p.m. is if you were a... Uh, famous Australian landmark, what would it be uh, and why? So uh, can you tell us what would you be and why do you think you'd be that? Um, yeah, I had to put, think about this one and I think I'd say the Blue Mountains um, because I have three sisters. <laughs> nice, okay. So a bit tenuous, but uh, you've got to go with something, right? Uh, now, Matt, you're a Christian, right? Awesome, awesome. Um, do you want to tell us quickly how that came about, how you became a Christian? Tell us a bit about that story so we can get to know you a little bit. Yeah, cool. So I, I grew up in a Christian family. So I grew up going to church and kids' church and uh, youth group. Um, but it wasn't until kind of the end of high school, the start of university, where I started reading the Bible for myself, um, particularly with a few kind of older Christian friends. Um, and it was through that, reading the Bible and seeing that Jesus is not only um, someone who came to save me, but someone who is the Lord of my life and I need to live for, live for him. Yeah. Yeah, Short story. awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, now, as you mentioned earlier, you kind of, you joined us. How many weeks before we went into lockdown were you a part of the congregation? Yeah, so I think I made it to three weeks, but thankfully I joined a Bible study early and I was able to go to three weeks of Bible study as well before. Nice, yeah. okay. And then we, we hit lockdown uh, and really you've only kind of seen um, people either through virtual kind of supper after church or the gospel team members, is that right? Yeah, yeah, so um, we had, uh, a couple of Bible studies beforehand, so I got to meet them a bit better. But um, pretty much I've only met people at 6 p.m. Um, online, um, which has been a bit tricky trying to get to know them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, do you want to tell us then, uh, with that experience, because that's a unique experience for, I think, uh, many people, uh, do you want to tell us uh, what's been some of the, the challenges about not being able to meet face-to-face -face, uh, with people as you've just joined the church? Yeah, so I, um, one thing I love about Christian community is how we... Um, encourage one another to keep living um, 
living upright lives for God. Um, and so it's been great that we've been able to do that in some small way online, but I really missed being able to do that um, with people in person. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, definitely. Um, so let me ask you, uh, the, we're in stage one now, the government's starting to kind of uh, give us an exit strategy and hopefully someday soon we'll be able to meet uh, face-to-face. What's actually something you're looking forward to about meeting face-to-face uh, with the other members of 6PM? Yeah, so I've, I've met a lot of the 6PM people online, um, but I'm really looking forward to actually coming together once again, um, all of us together, and actually be able to meet people and fellowship together. Um, yeah, as, as we have before, but yeah, keeping on going onwards after this. Yeah, yeah. nice, awesome. Uh, we're really looking forward to getting back together and you being able to meet Matt a whole lot more in person uh, and also Ben, they're both really new to our congregation. It's great that they've been able to join us. Uh, and just as we kind of uh, finish up, um, what is uh, one of the ways or a few ways that we might be able to pray for you uh, as a Christian uh, during this time? Yeah, so a couple of ways. Um, it's coming to the end of the semester, so pray for um, diligence and studies would be great. Um, but also pray for my godliness. Um, it's hard when we can't see people to, um, yeah, to keep going strong. Um, so just pray that I would, yeah, be diligent in seeking out God. Yeah, nice. Awesome. Well, as I said, uh, when we're back together, please introduce yourself to Matt and to Ben, his housemate. They'll love to get to know you. Uh, they're really great guys. Uh, so how about we spend some time praying for Matt and for Ben and, uh, then we'll move on to the next thing in our service. So let's pray together at 6 p.m. Let's talk to God. Father, thank you so much for Matt and Ben. We thank you that they decided to join 6 p.m. and Northmead, even under these difficult circumstances. Please help Matt in particular as he heads towards uh, his final exams for this semester. Uh, please help him to study well, to retain the knowledge that he learns, and uh, to do his very best uh, in, in that um, exam period. We also pray for his godliness. Uh, with the ability uh, being taken away from us to be able to meet face to face and the struggles that brings within our lives as Christians. Please help Matt uh, to be able to continue to strive for godliness, continue to come to your word and come to you in prayer that he might live as a man who honors you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Cool. Well, thanks again, 6 p.m. And we can't wait to see you all very soon. Hi, 6 p.m. I'm Shelley. Um, how great is it that God gives us his word and that he speaks to us through it? Um, today we're reading from Philippians 4, verses 1 to 9. So then, my dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy and crown, in this manner stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I urge Eudia and I urge Sintik to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything. But in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is anything any moral excellence, and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Hi there, everyone. Adrian here. It's really great that we can continue to study God's Word and learn together from the book of Philippians. And today we're in chapter 4. And you know, one of the fundamental truths about Christianity is that you can't do it on your own. You need help from your friends. That's what church is. Even the great leaders of the Bible show us 
this is true. I think about Moses. You know, back in Exodus 17, as Israel go into battle against the Amalekites, and, and when Moses holds his arms in the air with the staff that God had given him, then Israel prevailed. But when his arms got tired and he had to kind of put them down, the Amalekites started winning. So what he ended up doing is he sat on a rock and Aaron on one side and her on the other, they held his arms up for him and Israel won. He couldn't do it on his own. He needed friends. Even in the next chapter, Exodus 18, Moses' father-in-law comes to visit him and he notices that Moses has to make every decision for the whole nation. And he says, you'll wear yourself out. You'll wear the people out. So you should appoint leaders and judges and elders. And, and he specifically says to Moses in Exodus 18, verse 18, you can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. And you know, even the great apostle Paul, the man who traveled the known world, the man who preached far and wide, who wrote so much of the New Testament, he couldn't do it on his own. When he writes his letters, he very often tells you who's with him. It's Paul and Sosthenes or Paul and Timothy or Paul and Silvanus. Uh, on his ministry journeys, he takes Luke with him. He takes Barnabas with him. He takes Silas with him. He's, he's always sending and encouraging greetings with people and exchanging Timothy going to them and then coming back to tell how they're going and sending people to other churches to find out how they are. He couldn't do it on his own. And so here in Philippians, he's already written back in chapter 1 of his joy because of their partnership in the gospel. He shares a joyful partnership with them, even while he's in prison in Rome and they are far away. And this is why he says, I miss all of you with the affection of Jesus Christ. He hates being apart from them. He desires to go to see them. He wants to fellowship with them and to be a comfort and an encouragement to them as they will be an encouragement to him. Which is why in chapter 4, verse 1, our passage today starts with him calling them his dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters. I mean, how good would that be for the great apostle Paul to call you dearly loved and longed for? He says, I'm so connected to you. I'm so joined to you through Jesus. We share salvation. We share God's love. We belong to Jesus and we share a mission and a purpose and an identity as citizens of heaven. So I dearly love you and I long for you because you are my brothers and sisters in Christ. And more than that, Paul says, because you are my joy and my crown. And so as we look at our passage today, this is the first point that I want us to consider. Christian joy delights in others. Christian joy delights in others. You are my joy, says Paul. Any joy I have is you, your salvation, the work God is doing in you, the fruit the Holy Spirit is bearing in you, the mind of Christ transforming you. You are my joy and my reward. You are my prize. You are what I look forward to having at the end of this long, hard road. You are the light at the end of the tunnel for me, he says, at the end of this enduring and striving and working for the Lord. The prize I long for, the crown I will receive, the joy that will fill my heart is you. That I get to share eternity with you. Christian joy delights in others. Can you see why it's been so hard for us not to be together? Not to be able to see each other? Can you see why it's so urgent that we get back together as soon as we can? This isolation is the worst. We need each other for joy. We should find delight in each other. And so Paul says, my brothers and sisters, in this manner, Stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. They are his friends. 
and he wants them to stand firm despite opposition, despite false teachers. And the way they will stand firm is what he has been saying in this letter, trusting in Christ, considering others' needs greater than their own. Consider everything to be a loss compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. Forget what is behind. Strive towards what is ahead. Pursue that goal, that prize, that eternal life that has been promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. That's how you will stand firm. And Christian joy delights in others and urges them to stand strong in Christ. But secondly, Christian joy unites with others and urges them to be reconciled. Christian joy unites with others, and you see this in verse 2. Paul goes on to say in chapter 4, verse 2, I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, there's obviously been some disagreement. There's been an argument. There's a dispute between Euodia and Syntyche, between these Christian women who Paul says contended for the gospel at my side. These are women Paul has shared ministry with. He's friends with them. He's worked with them. He's sad to hear of this dispute. And we don't know what it's about. We don't know who's right and who's wrong and who should repent. And, but Paul says, I urge both of you to agree in the Lord. Notice he's not saying, pretend everything's okay. Bury that resentment down deep. Stop bringing up the subject. He doesn't say that. He's urging them to find agreement in the Lord. What unites us is not our opinions or our personalities or our tastes. The Lord Jesus unites us. Joyful partnership in Jesus is what unites us together. Knowing Jesus, worshipping Jesus, serving Him as King, as Lord, is what binds us together. It's the truth that unites us. And notice, this affects the whole church. Not as an opportunity to gossip or to take sides, which is very easy to do, isn't it? But, verse 3, Paul says, Yes, I also ask you, true partner, true fellow worker. Church, we're in this together. Help these women. But notice the sad note there at the end of verse 3. He mentions the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life, which is a way of describing believers, those who are saved, but it particularly emphasises that it's God's decision to save them, it's God's choice, it's God's decree who will be saved. That's what the Bible says. And the sad thing is that not all those who worked alongside Paul stuck with the gospel. You know, Jesus had his Judas who betrayed him. Paul had a man called Demas who worked with him, but then at the end abandoned him, deserted him because he loved this present world more. So, in contrast, are those whose names are in the book of life, in God's book. So Christian joy, Paul says, unites with others. Having Jesus as Lord unites us with each other. It's crucial to who we are. Do you know, back in chapter 1, verse 27, Paul said just one thing. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I will hear about you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. You see, the life that is worthy of the good news of forgiveness and freedom, salvation and eternal life, the life that is worthy of the gospel is a life 
united with fellow Christians, standing firm in one spirit, living in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. Because Christian joy delights in others, Christian joy unites with others. And then next we see that Christian joy endures and never ceases. Christian joy endures. That's what Paul says in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Irrespective of circumstances, despite opposition and ridicule, despite not fitting into this present world in the face of physical and emotional and relational and spiritual suffering, always rejoice in the Lord. And in case you missed it, Paul says again, always rejoice in the Lord. You won't be able to rejoice always in money. You won't be able to rejoice always in health or your home or your success. These things come and go and they fade and they let you down. But rejoice in the Lord. And remember, this this isn't the advice of some preacher who's about to buy his third private jet and he's speaking to you from his 27-bedroom mansion with 15 cars in the garage and he's got a yacht urging you to be joyful no matter what, and by the way, you should send him more money. No, as Paul writes this, he's in prison. As Paul writes this, he's far away from home. He's far away from loved ones. As Paul writes this, there is an active campaign of people trying to make him suffer more, trying to shut him up and make his life more miserable. And Paul writes this, And he knows exactly what it's like to suffer. And he says, I am joyful. I am uplifted and I am upheld and I am happy. I'm filled with contentment. I'm overflowing with happiness. I have abundant peace. I have a satisfaction that no one and nothing can take away from me because my joy is in Jesus and no one and nothing can take him away from me. And I see the work he is doing in you, Paul says, saving you, completing you, maturing you. I know his plans to give you eternal life in new resurrection bodies. There's no sadness or mourning or crying or pain and it fills me with joy. So my brothers and sisters, rejoice always by focusing on Jesus by knowing Jesus always. And fourthly, Paul says, Christian joy is gentle. Christian joy is calm. It's it's gentle. Listen to how it flows on. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your graciousness, your gentleness be known to everyone. See, if you're someone who is always rejoicing in Jesus, always delighting in Jesus and in his people, if you're always finding God's eternal joy, no matter what is happening in your life, what will be known to people is your gentleness and your graciousness. Christian joy is calm and it's gracious and it's kind and it's gentle because it delights in others and it unites with others. It's not always jumping up and down and shouting. It's not always fist-pumping triumphalism. Let your graciousness be known, your gentleness be known, because your joy and delight is in Jesus and the Lord is near and people will know it. And so fifthly, we see here that Christian joy is always confident. Christian joy is always confident. Have a look at verse 6. Don't worry about anything. How can he say that? How can he say don't be anxious about anything? Don't worry about anything. It sounds impossible. Impossible. Does, Does he mean don't care about anything? 
Well, you know what's interesting? The Lord Jesus himself says the same thing. So that's a reasonable reference point to back Paul up on this. Jesus in Matthew 6 says, don't worry about material possessions, but seek first the kingdom of God. Don't worry about your life, your clothes, your food, your tomorrow. God provides and you are precious to him. So seek first the kingdom. Pursue first God's righteousness. Now, Jesus isn't saying don't have those things or think about those things. He's actually talking about your reliance. It's not wrong to go to work. It's not wrong to do your groceries. But what are you trusting in? Who are you relying in? Both Paul and Jesus know that there are many things that can cause us to feel anxious and worried. But to worry about those things as your source of identity and your security, it's a fearful kind of doubt. What if I don't have enough? What if it all runs out? It's a stressful anxiety. It's an uncertainty verging on panic that fills your mind and your heart. But Philippians 4 verse 6 says, don't worry about anything. You hear that? For Christians, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that should cause us to doubt or fear or stress or be anxious or be overwhelmed or be worried because we can always rejoice because we always know the Lord is near. The opposite of worry is trust in Jesus. The opposite of trust in Jesus is being anxious and worried. So don't worry, but in everything, pray. In everything, pray. There's our confidence. There's our trust. There is our certainty. We trust God. And so we present our requests to God. That's what prayer is. When it all boils down, prayer is really two things that you see here in Philippians. It's thanking God, so with thankfulness for what He's given, appreciating and noticing all He's done, and it's asking God for what we need. It's thanking God for what He's given and asking God for what we need. There's no need to worry when we can always be thankful and we can always turn to God in dependence and prayer in petition, in requests, in asking Him for what we need. And the promise is not that we will always be rich. We will always have our physical needs met. No, the promise is deeper. It's a promise that satisfies our soul. Verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. See, Paul isn't saying you're not allowed to worry or just use your willpower to hang in there and be strong. No, he says, instead of worrying, turn to God. Throw yourself upon God's strength. Rest yourself in God's hands. Rely on His fatherly loving care. Because when you turn to God in dependence and prayer and turn away from anxiety and fear, you will be filled with peace. A peace that is beyond comprehension. A peace that surpasses understanding. It's the peace of knowing that you are dearly loved and longed for by God Himself. It's the peace of knowing that your sins have been washed away. And God's anger has been turned aside. What stands between us and God is no longer a barrier of our failure and His righteous anger. But there's nothing between us anymore. But there's just warm love and welcome and the embrace of a father welcoming a long lost son. Jesus died to bring us peace with God. The certainty and confidence and assurance that God is on our side. The peace of the gospel that 
We were once his enemies. We were once far away. But he died for us and brought us peace. That knowledge, that experience, that love, that care, that fatherly welcome and embrace, that confidence will guard you and protect you and keep you safe. It will protect your heart. It will protect your mind. And so Christian joy is confident. Sixthly, Christian joy dwells on what is good. Christian joy always dwells on what is good. You know, sometimes I think we struggle with joy as Christians because of what we fill our eyes with, because of what we fill our minds with and our hearts with. We spend hours on the internet. We binge TV shows. We look over the fence at our neighbours. We can't help but feel that the world is having something that we're missing out on. The grass is greener on the other side, isn't it? So even when we're not sinning, we're thinking how fun it might be. And so we struggle to be joyful because we end up thinking that God is limiting us. But really, it's because we're thinking about things that can never provide us with real joy. But real Christian joy comes when we dwell and think deeply when we ponder and we meditate upon what brings deep spiritual satisfaction. In Philippians 4 verse 8, Paul says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence, And if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Think hard about what is good, what pleases God. Spend time filling your heart and filling your soul with what is pure and what is excellent and what is lovely and what brings honour to God. The songs that you sing, the words that you use, the things that you go over and over in your mind, let them be dedicated to God, honourable to God, pleasing to God. And you know what? This is something that is really, really hard to do on your own. We need each other. We need help from our friends. This is why we need to keep meeting together. It's why we need to keep talking together letting the word of Christ dwell amongst us richly. We need to keep helping each other put these honourable and good and lovely and pure eternal things in the forefront of our minds while the world is shoving all this gunk in front of us to push that aside and find real joy in what is good. Because Christian joy dwells on what is good but also acts on it. And that's how Paul finishes this section, verse 9. Paul says, dwell on those things and then do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. Christian joy dwells on truly joyful heavenly things but also acts on them those things that we've learned and received and heard and seen in others, we receive them, think about them and act on them and the God of peace will be with us. Which in the end is how we can have real Christian joy because the God of peace is with us. Because we have the God of peace, then we have joy. Joy that delights in others. Joy that unites with others. Joy that rejoices always. That is calm and gentle. That is confident and prayerful. That dwells on what is good and acts on it. So let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your amazing work of saving us 
transforming us and uniting us together in Christ. Father, thank you for revealing who you are and what you've done for us in Jesus' death and resurrection. We pray, Father, that you would fill us with joy a joy that delights and unites and endures and is confident and is gentle. And Father, please fill us with a joy that is in the truly joyful things, the spiritual blessings that you've given us in Jesus. And Father, we pray that you would keep us united and bring on that day when we get to express that unity perfectly. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, my name's Roz. I'm a member here at North Mead 6pm Night Church. In our passage today, it, um, it assures us that we should always, always make our requests known to God and not be anxious about anything. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you have come near to us, that you have sent your son Jesus among us and that he is present with us by your spirit. Even though you are greater than we can imagine, you have made yourself known to us. Although we are frail and sinful, you strengthen us and give us forgiveness through the death of Jesus. Even more, you have made a place for us in heaven and given us an eternal hope. Please forgive us for the times we are too focused on your good gifts in this life and lose sight of you, the giver. Please forgive us for the times when we are anxious about the cares of life and our trust in you wavers. Help us instead to rejoice in you, to praise you for good things and turn quickly to you with our prayers. Father, we know that you will make all things new and that the troubles of our times are not beyond your reach. We ask that you might have mercy on us, your creatures, and bring healing on the earth, that this COVID pandemic might end. Until then, we pray that you would give wisdom and compassion to our leaders and to all those with responsibilities, great or small, especially as restrictions are eased. We pray for recovery for the afflicted, provision for those who have lost income, comfort for those mourning, and protection for the vulnerable. We ask also that we, your people, might have patience and love and graciousness that is evident to all for the sake of Jesus' name. We pray for our missionary friends, Mark and Renee in New Zealand, and Mike and Tanya with their children in Spain. We thank you that you have continued to strengthen and sustain them, leading them as they seek out new ways to connect with people for, through, for the gospel through technology. We pray particularly for Mark and Renee for extra strength and rest as this is their 20th year. We pray for the people they work among, many of whom are struggling in, in various ways, for their church communities and Christian students, that they might be strengthened to stand firm and continue to reach out for others. Thank you that both countries' isolation restrictions are beginning to ease. We pray particularly for Spain, where there is much grief and anxiety. We pray that people might find real hope in Jesus Christ. Thank you that even while isolated in not human terms, we are never isolated from you but remain united in Christ and that you are drawing all things together in him. Amen. Hi there, everyone. Adrian here with news about our plans for what it will look like under God for our church as restrictions get eased over the coming weeks and months. First of all, I want to say how thankful to God I am for your patience and endurance. It's been really hard, but it's been great to see you all hanging in there, getting involved as much as you can and doing church from home while watching things online. I also want to say how thankful to God I am for the overwhelming generosity many of you have shown in continuing to give to the work of the gospel, but also in dropping off groceries for our care packs. God is really good. Now, no, do no doubt you're aware the government has announced their three-step plan for lifting restrictions. So as a church, we've prayerfully considered how we can wisely make preparations for what these steps might look like for us. Now, we know things may change 
and different announcements will be made in response to things. But for now, we've produced our own version of the three steps. We've tried to go through our kind of core ministries and what they might look like in the different steps that the government has outlined to kind of track through what it would look like for us here at Northmead. Northmead. And we've emailed this to everyone on Friday and you can find that on our website. Let me run through very briefly the main features of each step. In step one, which we're already in, that means home visits can have five people, gatherings at church can be ten people, as well as the minister with them. So while this doesn't change much about having to record church and have it available online, it does mean we can start to have people around to our homes to watch church together. It also means that we can have some gospel teams of 10 people or less use the church buildings in accordance with our COVID-safe church use guidelines and checklist. Now, step two, which could possibly happen next month, means we can have gatherings at church of 20 people. But there's no indication yet of what home visits might look like. What it means is the big change we're getting ready for in step two is that we can have kids alive back on at church as a drop your kids off ministry. This would be for preschool up to year six. Uh, The numbers of kids and the leaders would be limited to 20. The program would run for an hour and a half. And while the kids are being taught God's word and seeing each other during that time, parents could go to someone else's home to watch church together with them and actually pay attention. Uh, Church will need to be a little bit shorter so that there's time to travel for drop off and pick up and time for chatting in homes together. You'll also see in step two that we're planning for Forge Youth Group to meet in four groups across Thursday and Friday in order to keep those numbers limited to 20 teens and leaders. And we're conscious that for the past couple of months, our kids and youth have really missed seeing each other, seeing their leaders, engaging and learning from the Bible together. So step two is really about getting those ministries function, uh, functioning even in a different kind of form. Now, step three is a little further down the track and it's a little harder for us to plan for, but the limit for gatherings is 100. This gives us a lot more freedom, but it still restricts our normal church congregational times. We're preparing for step three to actually last for quite some time and we're super keen to be gathering together again because God's word and our love for Jesus urges us to this. But because we need to keep Uh, the combined adults and kids numbers under 100, then we're proposing at step three of having five gatherings over the weekend. Three of them would offer kids alive. Uh, The times will need to be confirmed, but we're thinking it would be possibly 8.45, 11 a.m., 4 p.m., 6.30 p.m. on a Sunday, and then Saturday afternoon at 5 p.m. Now, we realise in our already disrupted lives, this means even more disruption and more change before we can feel things are back to normal. It's hard, I get that. But God's word tells us, never give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage each other and all the more as you see the day of Christ approaching. We need each other. We can't do this on our own. We need to be together. We need the comfort and the friendship and the support. We need the togetherness of brothers and sisters in Christ, of fellow workers, fellow servants who belong to the Lord. God's work in the world is gathering people to himself through the cross of Christ. God's kingdom is about uniting people together in him through faith in Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. He calls us and includes us in this mission. But we can't do it on our own. We need each other. And so this way is our prayer that God would enable us to be able to work together and be together in service of the Lord Jesus. Thanks, everyone. Once these streets had sung
Thanks very much, guys. Uh, it's been great uh, that you guys joined us for Church Online. Uh, if you want to uh, get in touch with us, uh, connect with us, please use that connection card uh, or go to our website. Um, you can email us or call us. Um, so if you want to do that, please do. Um, tonight, we yeah just been looking at um, Philippians chapter 4, um, the beginning half of that. Um, I've been reminded uh, from something in that, uh, from verse 8, uh, it's been great um, to see um, what Paul focuses on and what he wants us to focus on. So as you guys, um, during your week, uh, before we come back again uh, to Church Online next week, I want you guys to be uh, reminded of this uh, from this passage uh, from verse 8 in uh, Philippians chapter 4. It says this, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence, and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Uh, it's really great to see, um, yeah, Paul's um, encouragement from there. Um, his, what he wants for us, what he wants us to, to dwell on um, through this time of, um, yeah, separateness and isolation, and we don't get to see many people. Um, you, can, you, you can, you know, we can be a bit sad and, and down uh, and upset. Um, but yeah, he asks, Paul asks us um, even now to be dwelling on, on the good things, to be dwelling on the things that he mentions in, uh, in verse 8. Um, so please be reminded of that. Um, and uh, yeah, as we, as, we do, as we do finish up tonight, uh, I'm going to pray. So please, yeah, pray with me. Lord God, uh, thank you so much uh, that we've had um, a night of, of praise to you, uh, a night of, of um, yeah, learning from your word. Uh, a night that we can, um, yeah, yeah, watch and 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 just understand, um, um, yeah, what you want us to um, know right now uh, during this time. Please be helping us to be, um, yeah, strong in the mind and be be uh, focusing on um, the things that you mention um, in this book, in in Philippians, in verse eight. Um, what you want us to be dwelling on. Um, please be. Um, um, ultimately um, be reminded of your son, uh, what he has done on the cross, um, what he has done for us, that we now have life because of his sacrifice. Um, please help us to be um, yeah, dwelling on this, reminded of this um, every day uh, through this tough time um, that we know we have Christ uh, on our side. Amen. I hope uh, that you guys come back and, and join uh, with us again, Church Online, next week. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much.